Our first item, excuse me, our first item on the agenda today is to ask members to take item three on the agenda in private. Are members agreed? Yeah. The second agenda item today is on Article 50, Preparedness, which forms part of the committee's scrutiny on the Article 50's negotiations process. And we have a round table of evidence uh, today, and I'd like to welcome uh, to the meeting Alistair Sim from University of Scotland, Claire Slipper, the Political Affairs Manager of the National Farmers Union in Scotland, uh, Paul Buckley, Director of Strategy and Policy at the General Medical Council, Matt Lancashire, De Director of Policy and Public Affairs at the Scottish Council for Development and Industry. Jennifer Hunter, Executive Leader with Cu Culture Counts. Chris Yarlsley, Policy Manager for the Freight Transport Association. And Gary Stevenson, the Chair of Food and Drink, the Food and Drink Federation Scotland. Uh, welcome. Uh, we have four themes for discussion uh, today uh, as set out in the committee papers and our, our first theme is the impact of the Brexit process to date. Um, so can I open the discussion on that theme by inviting um, our, our witnesses to um, share with us what the impact of the Brexit, Brexit process to date has been on their sector? Claire, yes. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I think last time I came to this committee was shortly after the referendum That's results right. where yeah. we were trying to process um, exactly where, where we were and where things were heading. And to some extent, we're kind of still in that state of um, flux <coughs> just now. Um, some background on NFU Scotland. We have um, about 8,500 8, farming and crofting businesses who are members. So that's who I'm here to represent today. Um, in terms of the, the impact of the Brexit process to date, I should make it clear from the start that um, prior to the referendum, we were of the view, having taken independent advice, that staying within the EU would probably be the best case scenario for our members in terms of continuity with markets um, and support. But we are obviously where we are now. In terms of the immediate impact, um, the fall in the exchange rate has had some short-term relief in terms of prices, uh, particularly for the sheep sector. Um, when the exchange rate falls, farm grape prices tend to actually um, increase, um, but that is very much a short-term uh, benefit for the sector. Um, what we have seen is that due to the fall in the exchange rate, we've had um, quite serious issues in recruiting labour from the EU. Um, this is a problem that we had prior to the referendum, but it's certainly been a catalyst um, that has sped this up, particularly in seasonal labour for the soft fruit and field veg, field veg <coughs> sectors. Um, and that's something which we anticipate will, will continue at pace. Um, ju just to be, to, to be quick in my remarks, I suppose that I think the, the ongoing uncertainty um, around Brexit has been very damaging to the confidence of our members. Um, we're, we've, we've felt it's, it's been very frustrating that for the last two and a half years we've felt unable to progress with domestic um, policies like um, you, you know looking at regulation and supply chains um, there's been a continued political stagnation as to where we will go um, with Brexit and, and this is very damaging to confidence um, and business decisions were being taken by our members at the time of the referendum that will have an impact long into the future um, and we still don't yet know um, what exactly Im what exact impacts there will be um, and we have seen um, a fall in investment within the sector as well and people holding off making big investments or um, you know, taking business decisions before they know uh, what the outcomes will be. So I'll leave it there for now. Thanks very much. And Matt, Matt you wanted to come in. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> Thank you, CDI here again today. I suppose it's just to echo some of the points that have been made. I think since the negotiations have started to take place on Article 50, there has been a negative impact across uh, businesses in Scotland. I should say SEDI represents uh, around about 1,200 members across uh, private and public sector in, in Scotland in itself. Um, business values stability, it values predictability. Um, many of the business leaders that we pe speak to from oil and gas to the financial services sector to professional services all bang that drum to an extent that they value stability and predictability. What Article 50 and the negotiations has given us is, is a lack of that stability because it's the unknown of what we're stepping into in the next few months as well as years. So the difficulty and complexity of the deep political nature of the negotiations has generated uncertainty, not just for them, but their employees too, particularly people 
who are from the EU themselves but work in Scotland, some very highly skilled labour in terms of do they stay in Scotland, do they move back, even though the assurance is that they have the right to remain post, uh, post leaving the EU. We've also, I think, just echoing the point, seen people delay, postpone, cancel investment decisions around expanding their business, scaling up, developing opportunities that would really progress the Scottish economy. But quite crucially for us at SCDI, investment is a key lever in supporting productivity. And we all know productivity is a massive issue, not just for the Scottish economy, but the UK economy as a whole. And we need to change that quickly to ensure that we still are a front runner economy in, in, in the rest with the competing with the rest of the world, keeping Scotland competitive. So all in all, it probably there is deep concerns about the negotiations. It has had a massive impact, has has reduced impact, uh, reduced investment. It has made talented people potentially leave the country in terms of not staying here post the post uh, the end of March. So in a nutshell, it's probably not the best thing for business that we've seen in the past couple of years. OK, thanks. Uh, Kenneth, you have a question. Yes, thanks very much. It's just a follow-on uh, uh, from, from Matt's comments. Uh, in, in your submission, you've said that uh, the UK government previously announced that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund will replace European Structural Funds Programme. However, little or no information on what it will be or how it, <coughs> it will operate has been released and more clarity on the design of this and other replacement schemes, particularly success of CEP, is urgently required because you've said that Scotland between 2014-2020 was set to receive 5.6 billion euros from the EU. Have you had any further information uh, basically on this and when do you think you will receive any information on it, if not? Um, we've not uh, to date seen more information on the Prosperity Fund in terms of the amount that will be there to, to support uh, businesses and other organisations within that. Um, we've also not seen, I suppose, the, the information around how that fund will be distributed and who will qualify and the criteria for doing so. Um, does it replace EU funds as such? Uh, I, I couldn't, wouldn't like to give an answer because I don't know the amount that will be, be in the fund. Um, I don't know what the criteria will be. I don't know what, who, what business will qualify. Um, is it something that can mitigate some of the impact of Brexit? Yes, I, I, I'd say that. Um, however, um, it won't mitigate Brexit as a whole in terms of the impact that will have on our economy, particularly if we uh, listen to Mark Carney's statement from the, the Bank of England yesterday. And will this fund be a short-term fix or will it be more permanent uh, from you, the information you've received? For, for the information that we've received, uh, we were unaware whether it's a short-term or, or long-term fix, but we have asked UK government for more information and I'm sure that they will uh, uh, disseminate that shortly. Okay. Does anyone else want to come in um, on Kenneth's question? Oh, sorry, no, sorry. Yes, Alistair. Oh, sorry. I was on just the generality of Article 50 anticipation of right, your first okay. question. Yes. Um, really just to say, I mean, I think um, as, as other witnesses have said, the uncertainty is, is, is really um, uh, the biggest problem. Um, I mean, our interaction with Europe is hugely important. If you look at academic staff, 17% of them are from the EU. Um, and that mobility of talent and ideas is just essential to, to, to being a successful university and, and they're a huge part of our community. Um, to date, we've been trying to get on with business as usual in anticipation um, of a deal that sustains our membership of European research networks and um, maintains student mobility, but obviously that prospect is uncertain. So, so far, um, universities have been getting on with um, recruiting uh, European staff, um, getting on with applying for Euro European research funds um, and recruiting European students. And, and, and what we've seen so far is that in general, the people who've, who've made the commitment to come and work in Scotland at Scotland's universities, although they're nervous at the moment, they're, they're, they're staying. Um, there are some experiences of it being more ex difficult to recruit staff from European Union countries to to, to, to Scottish universities because they are uncertain about the future, but it's certainly not come to, to a stop. Um, and we're still relatively successfully recruiting um, European students who, who add so much to our academic mix. Um, I think the real um, concern that, that, that becomes more and more pressing um, is 
what's going to happen next. Um, are we heading towards a no-deal scenario, um, in which case um, the mobility of staff, the mobility of students, um, our, our participation in European research networks, um, the ability of students to go abroad and do, do an Erasmus um, study as part of their programme, all, all, all these vast uncertainties are, are really hurtling towards us extremely quickly. So the sooner um, we know um, what, what the future is going to look like and what a relationship with the EU is going to be, um, and the closer that is, the better. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, Paul Buckley. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, and thank you for inviting the GMC to the roundtable this morning. Uh, echoing comments by colleagues, the main issue for the GMC is the regulation of the medical profession is uncertainty, particularly uncertainty as to the basis on which EA doctors will be registered by the GMC from the end of next March. Currently, uh, European professionals benefit from what's called automatic recognition, that is their qualifications are automatically recognised by all member states. That means that the process of getting doctors into the NHS, onto the front line, is very quick and straightforward. But what we don't know is what the arrangements are going to be from the end of March, particularly in the event of a no deal. As far as Scotland's health service specifically is concerned, there are some 20,000 doctors, around 6% uh, of whom uh, are EEA doctors, and they make an enormous contribution uh, across the service, but particularly in some of the remote and rural territorial boards. Also in some particular specialties, such as anaesthetics, uh, pathology, surgery, um, the uh, percentage of uh, EEA doctors is of the order of 15% or so. so it's very significant. Uh, group of the workforce. Of course, for doctors who are already here, um, their position as far as registration is concerned won't change whatever scenario uh, happens uh, next March. But the issue is more in relation to the future flow of doctors into the health services across the UK where we're not clear on what basis those uh, doctors are going to be registered and therefore what impact that might be having on their plans to move to the UK or not. Thank you very much. Stuart McMillan, you had a question. Uh, yes, it was for Alistair Sim. Um, just regarding the Erasmus schemes, I hosted an, an Erasmus event here in Parliament uh, earlier on this year and I studied through an Erasmus scheme, so I know how important that actually is. And I also know it's been a challenge over the years trying to get Scottish students to actually go and study. Uh, take part in courses, they get a chance to go and study elsewhere. Uh, in terms of the, the un discussions within universities now, um, are, is there any discussion that's taking place regarding um, not running as many courses uh, where there is the opportunity to go and study uh, within the European Union uh, over the course of the next number of years? Um, uh, broadly speaking, we're, we're trying to, to, to maintain confidence that, that, that we're heading towards a negotiated outcome with the EU, and in, in that case, um, certainly one of the priorities that we've stressed the UK government, and I think the UK government has, has taken on, um, is participation in Erasmus. For the reasons you describe, it's vastly important both for talent coming here and, and, and for the internationalised experience of our own students. Um, I think the problem as we face it now is we don't know whether in fact we're crashing out on the 29th of March mm -hmm. without a deal um, and, and falling out of the Erasmus programme in, in that way. Um, and we don't know if we have a deal um, where Erasmus will fit in. I think at least if we if we leave the European Union um, with some negotiated outcome, um, it will provide for um, you know immediate continuity of, of people doing Erasmus and things like that. And, the pro and I would say at least the probability um, of, of that being um, part of our long-term relationship with the EU. Okay, thank well, you. On Erasmus, has, have you been given any indication as to how the UK government is going to evaluate the various schemes? I mean, we have been hearing that it may be on a value for money basis. Um, the, the simple answer is, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, if you look at what the, um, the, the UK government published um, in its various um, position, position statements on, on Brexit uh, and its no deal note on Erasmus, um, even the very generalised words of the political declaration, um, you know, they point in a direction of continuing um, relationship with the EU on student mobility as well as, um, as on um, research cooperation, but um, we, we are in a position of uh, high uncertainty. Okay, thanks very much.
Alexander. We've touched on the high uncertainty and you've all indicated that confidence and continuity is vitally important. Uh, can I ask if some of you can give us an idea of what contingency plans that you've, uh, you've tried to put in place to try and mitigate some of the situations or circumstances that you may find yourselves in? Uh, and, and how that is being managed, and if you are still working with partners uh, in Europe at the moment, and how you see that developing uh, after March. Who wants to? I'm happy to um, say what the GMC's perspective is on, on this. So, um, our strong advice to the UK government has been to maintain a continuity of supply so far as possible, even in the event of a no-deal situation, so that if um, we were no longer part of the automatic recognition arrangements, um, we've said that it would make sense and I think would be important for, nevertheless, the GMC to be able to recognise European qualifications without having to put those doctors through the very laborious and time-consuming processes that apply to doctors from other parts of the world. That's what we would like to see for a period of a couple of years or so, during which we can work with partners, work with government, Scottish government, uh, and other colleagues to devise a future, more flexible registration framework that would apply to uh, the, the whole of the world outside the UK. That's what we would want in the event of a, a no deal. We've also been doing a lot of work with our IT systems so that we can switch on uh, a number of different possibilities depending on what the eventual outcome is. That is quite costly. We're also having to recruit additional staff in order to cope for all eventualities. So our registration systems will be able to deal with a, a, a no-deal outcome in terms of the mechanics, but clearly we're now uh, at a point very close to EU exit day where we don't know what the position is and we regard it as very, very important that we get certainty on that as soon as possible. Okay. Matt, did you want to come in? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just very briefly to, to let others uh, uh, enjoy the discussion too. Um, yeah, I think we've seen um, preparations across businesses uh, sector in Scotland in terms of the divergent scenarios that could take place, no deal, this deal, that deal, and what, and, and still there's something to play for in that transition period too, if there was a deal of, of, of any kind too. I don't think it would just be as clear cut as, as, as uh, if the deal goes through Parliament uh, next week as well. Um, to the degree which businesses have managed to do that, it's probably more larger businesses, uh, global businesses that have been able to to have the resource and the knowledge base and the capability, capacity to to build those scenario plannings, i.e. what it'll mean for trade, what it'll mean for exporting, what it'll mean for their supply chain, what it'll mean for X, Y, and Z, uh, and been able to, to put activity into that. Uh, probably not the case for SMEs in Scotland, and we are a nation of SMEs in Scotland. Our, our, our business base is, is not entirely SMEs, but it's very significant to our economy moving forward. And, and particularly, they don't have the resource, time, or, or generally the capacity to be able to build those scenarios moving forward. So that's a significant concern on whatever deal is, no deal, the deal that we've got on the table, or whatever anything else transpires over the next few weeks. Um, we've also seen, I, I, I think, uh, a lack of clarity going back to the, the process again that's allowed that those uh, scenarios to be built. I think the only saving grace in that is that UK government have put out the UK government technical notices across the different sectors and streams that have provided some comfort for some of the industries and sectors that we work in. Um, however, they don't, don't go the whole hog and detail what the deal will be at the end of the day. And without that clarity, it doesn't matter what scenario you it doesn't matter what scenario you build uh, until you've got clarity of the deal. Okay. All bets are off. Thanks very much. Uh, Chris Yarlsley. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, the FTA represents uh, freight and logistics companies across the UK in all modes of transport, so road, rail, maritime, um, and aviation. Um, just want to pick up on that. Other, First of all, yes, the uncertainty is causing a great deal of... Um, problems for our members because they uh, as always business needs to know what it's planning for and if you don't know what you're planning for and we don't know what we are planning for it's impossible to plan for it um, in terms of uh, contingency planning um, 
I pick up on the skills skills point. Um, we have a declaration from the UK government that uh, EU 27 nationals will be given the right to remain and work under a settled status scheme in the UK, but the legislation is not there at the moment. We need that to be brought forward quickly. So we have the legal certainty rather than simply a, a statement of um, intent from, from ministers because uh, we have, as with all sectors, there are a great deal of um, EU, work, EU 27 workers in the UK and in a sector which is the logistics sector, which is already facing extreme skill shortages, um, any loss of uh, labour there will cause uh, serious problems for the supply chain. In terms of how do we keep Britain trading on day one, um, you know, the, again, the uh, notices have been useful, but business does need to know what it's planning for. You can't, business doesn't have the resource to put in place plans for every uh, outcome. Um, so what we are doing at the moment is advising our members to sort of plan for the worst outcome um, because then anything else is a positive on top of that. Um, we do agree that uh, a no-deal exit is simply not acceptable. There is, the, the, there is no time left to put in place uh, uh, the kind of the fr legislative framework, the legal framework at the moment for us to keep moving on day one. Um, we have had, like, for example, an agreement on air services between the UK and the USA that's just been published this morning. However, that's fine for uh, passenger aviation, but that will not cover um, cargo, belly hole cargo, which most uh, commercial uh, com uh, civil aviation carries, because the security clearances will not be there in place uh, before Brexit Day. Uh, for, so all the belly hole cargo will have to be taken out of the planes, for example. Um, at the moment, this week, the uh, government uh, has just opened up its permit scheme, so British hauliers can now apply for permits to uh, use on uh, for uh, crossings into the EU after. But again, that's only going to cover about five to seven percent of the demand necessary. So uh, we desperately need, and it's the view of our association that the withdrawal agreement is agreed to. A to allow the transition period to come into play so we can then get the agreements in place. So there is con continuity of business um, post March 29th next year. Okay, was your supplementary in terms of so what Chris has just yes, said? Yes, okay. yeah. yeah, very briefly. It was just um, um, what you've said in your submission, just what you just touched on, you said another major concern is unless an agreement is reached on European law, there will only be 103 international haulage permits to cover the 300,000 journeys made by British trucks to Europe every year. And what you're saying is, uh, in, in effect, this is you're being asked to destroy the businesses of your international haulage members. I just wonder if you can comment a wee bit further on that. It does seem alarming, 103 permits, and you're saying only 5 to 7 per cent. So what would be the actual impact in terms of delivery of goods and services to the UK as a result of that? So the permit scheme is uh, based under the ECMT permit scheme, which is, uh, it exists already. Um, but it's just not used because we are part of uh, the single mm -hmm. market. Um, there is a multiplier effect. So the 103 gets multiplied mm -hmm. if you are using Euro 6, which is the cleanest uh, emission standard you have for HGVs. So there's the multiplier effect. So you get to 1,000, but that is it. And we are looking, and it's per vehicle as well. So the permit has to travel with the vehicle and come back. So it's not per company. So we're talking about vehicles. So that will put a great strain on the ability for UK PLC to trade outside of uh, uh, outside of the UK into the EU 27. And that's just on the vehicle. We're not even haven't even touched upon the recognition of uh, professional qualifications. So the driver, driver driving driving license, the driver professional competencies documentation. All of that still needs to be put in place. But um, yeah, we are talking about um, having a very restricted access to the wider European market. And conversely, um, uh, coming into the UK, you know, are there other, are other member states uh, prepared for, the, for their permits to enter the UK? We're unsure about that. So there could be a bit of a, a, um, a, you know, a bottleneck if um, it does need to come into use. Thank you. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. I was interested in uh, culture accounts submission and what kind of impact the uncertainty is having on your sector. I mean, maybe there's other sectors around the table. It's more evident. or it's, um, Do you think government has an understanding of what the issues are facing the cultural sector, which is a sector which is really important um, to Scotland? Um, <clears throat> 
cultures come up in some of the documents, but usually under agriculture or aquaculture, not on its own. Um, so yeah, there, there's many, there's, there's various issues. One of the problems is that we can't gather evidence for them. So you can't prove that you haven't been booked to play a European festival because you're a UK artist, you know, um, because people would just say, oh, well, maybe you just didn't get chosen because they preferred other bands or whatever. Um, so it's quite hard for us to get the evidence to show what's happening. Mm -hmm. But basically, we're quite unpopular in terms of um, if you're a booker, you know, in France, would, would you risk booking British bands when you don't know how much that's going to cost you in visa costs or carnet costs? And same with digital publishing. If you were booking for Grey's Anatomy um, for the soundtrack, would you be choosing British publishing when you don't know what's going to happen with the digital single market? So lots of uncertainty in terms of everything we do, in terms of the goods, in terms of services, in terms of people, and in terms of the digital stuff. Mm -hmm. So the same as everyone else, uncertainty is really the big problem for us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the, the recent announcements on goods um, are quite interesting. They could maybe help us a little. But again, most of our work is actually services and digital. So the good stuff really only helps us for like vinyl, DVD books, um, which is quite a small area for us. Um, but so is it quite, because um, I, I was just thinking, when you, in your submission you talk about big festivals and, and that kind of thing, there will be, I'd imagine, quite a lot of international acts, so there is already systems that would deal with visas and there'll be costs involved if you're booking a band from Canada or America or that, yeah. the, the, that the sector's used to. Is it just then as much the degree of uncertainty that they don't know what will be attached to additional costs with European yeah, so it's you, around not any, knowing. Measure yeah. of, is there a difference between decisions they make about who to book or who to, based on where they're coming from, with additional costs that significant? Or? Yeah, so it, it basically depends on the level. So if you're talking high level stuff, they've got the budgets anyway. It's more the small to medium level. So it's little folk festivals and things like that, rather, and that's the kind of day to day work for a lot of people. So it's not really the big festivals or or that kind of thing, because they've got the budgets to pay the visas for anyone they like anyway. It's more of the day-to-day -day stuff, small touring bands, small to medium enterprises, basically, are the ones that are hit most from it because they're doing the smaller gigs. But the smaller gigs will automatically have smaller budgets to spend on visas. And the problem is, as well, visas are per person. So if you know, you've know you got seven people in the band, it's not just one, it's seven, plus all the equipment. Um, so when you don't know how much that's going to cost and you're already quite a small budget, you're, you're probably not going to take the risk on that. You know, if you don't know. Thanks very much. Uh, Jamie Green. Thank you, convener. Good, good morning to our panel guests. Um, just a couple of things picking up on the interesting conversation we're having. The first one is for NFU Scotland. Um, in a, a previous submission you've given to this parliament, um, you said that leaving the European Union presents the first opportunity in over 40 years to overhaul and rebalance Scottish agricultural policy. Um, that seems to conflict somewhat with your opening statement that you said previous analysis said that the status quo is better. Can you just try and explain that to me? Yeah, um, you're quite right. Um, we do see the opportunity of leaving the CEP and being able to um, sort of common agricultural policy, the CAP, um, as an opportunity to, to recast and redesign the way that we support our farming businesses. Um, in my opening statement, what I referred to was, in terms of that, that quantum of funding, it would have been guaranteed if we were to stay within the EU, and clearly the whole trading framework and regulatory framework around it um, sort of supports our farming businesses as well. Um, so if, if we have that in the face of you know, a no deal or um, uncertainty um, at the time, we took the decision that it would be best to, to stay within. But, <clears throat> we we are leaving and we do see it as um, a significant opportunity because as much as the, the CAP has been useful in, in providing a, a, you know, a financial cushion and certainty for our farming businesses, it, it can be much better targeted, um, particularly in Scotland. Um, so at, at the moment, uh, we're doing a huge amount of work to look into the, the possible policy tools that we could use in Scotland to better support our farmers. Um, there's clearly a, you know, a bit of big question over funding. Uh, the UK Treasury has guaranteed that the same um, quantum of cash support will be guaranteed up to 2022, which is welcome, but is only up to 2022. And we, we do need um, some sort of commitment beyond that point, because what we need to do is start you know, moving our agricultural businesses to, to think 15, 20, 30 years into the future um, and being supported by policy to do that. 
Um, but we're, we're pleased with the proposals that we've come up with and the reception that they've had from stakeholders and from government as well. Um, so that, that could be an opportunity so long as we are supported by the trading framework and don't come crashing out of the EU because that would be the worst case scenario. Thank you, that's very helpful. And I had another question based on some other comments made and this one is for the General Medical Council. Just regarding uh, the pipeline of doctors, it's obviously very important to the NHS in Scotland. I think you said that 15% uh, of doctors in Scotland currently are EEA origin, is that correct? It, it's actually 6%, but in some specialties it's as much as 15%. Okay, and do you have any statistics on what percentage uh, of doctors are uh, non-EEA, but from overseas? Um, we do. I don't have that figure in my head. It would be of the order of around 20% or so, but uh, we can confirm that subsequently. Okay, so if, uh, given where we're at at the moment, uh, uh, and, and again, notwithstanding any uncertainty around uh, access from, from, from uh, Labour from the EU, uh, what do you think uh, would uh, need to be the heart of any future immigration policy concerning the NHS, both in Scotland and other parts of the UK. Uh, do you think any changes to the uh, visa or, or, or immigration services that um, allowed for opportunities for doctors to come from anywhere in the world with the right skills that we need, uh, where they may be currently finding it difficult, uh, you know, should be at the heart of, of future changes. Would that be a welcome change, for example, in a, sh in a, in a shift in policy? So uh, immigration policy is outside our direct responsibilities. However, earlier this year, when there were um, a, a lot of reports in the media that doctors seeking to come to the UK were unable to get a visa and therefore the NHS shortages were being exacerbated, we made clear to government that we thought that it was very frustrating that whereas health departments were trying to get more doctors into the system, the immigration arrangements were working against that and the government has now relaxed those arrangements. So not directly a matter for us, but we have contributed to that debate. Okay, and just about, finally, does your organisation get involved with government strategy on um, supporting a pipeline of doctors from within Scotland or within the UK uh, to ensure that if in the event that there are shortages from overseas, that there's, uh, and given the timeline it takes, I could presume to, to get somebody qualified to do this type of specialist work, that, that no matter what happens, we do have adequate supplies of, uh, of, of workforce from within. So we have a statutory responsibility for all stages of medical education, inclu including undergraduate education. We quality assure medical schools, including Scottish uh, medical schools and the new programme, ScotGem, that's just getting underway. So the numbers aren't directly a matter for us, but quality and standards are absolutely for us. And we work very closely with Scottish Government and all the colleagues to maintain those standards. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. I think it's fair to say we're moving on to the, the second theme, which is the proposed withdrawal agreement, the political decla declaration and the alternative approaches to Brexit. Can I ask a quick supplementary of Claire Slipper, actually? Um, when you were talking about the transition period, uh, when, when we were in um, Brussels, uh, we were told that the transition period could be extended, of course. And, um, so the withdrawal agreement says to 20. 22 if need be but one of the things that came out is that the funding uh, for cap will change in europe uh, halfway through that period and uh, in the withdrawal agreement it says that any any policy decisions made here in the uk would need to uh, align uh, in some ways with whatever happens in brussels but we wouldn't have any say in shaping that what's your response to that there's a few things there, um, and you're, you're quite right. So Europe is currently looking into the next phase of uh, cap reform. It, it reforms every seven years. Um, and so that, that, that will take place um, and kick in about 2021. Um, so in terms of what we can spend money on domestically here, whether we're inside or outside the EU, we do need legal mechanisms in place to ensure that ministers have the power to make payments. But that, that's in place and in some, you know, uh, guaranteed to some extent by the um, either the Scottish government's continuity bill or the UK government's withdrawal act. Um, in terms of the policy alignment, um, it, it, I think it would depend on if the transition were to be extended. It would, I presume, there would be some form of um, 
agreement and we'd, we'd have to study the, the wording of that in due course. But I think what we're looking at is in terms of the regulatory alignment, we don't want to diverge too much from what Europe are doing anyway because we're still needing to tra trade with them. They're our biggest market. So regulation wise, I think, uh, you know, so, some form of alignment is what we'll be looking for in the short to medium term anyway. Um, it's more in terms of the specific policy tools within that framework that um, you, you design and deliver um, domestically here in Scotland. We do think there could be some leeway to do that quite differently to what is currently done under the CAP. Um, and, and that's the real opportunity that we see. But regulation wise, um, if it's, you know, across things like animal health and welfare and pesticides regulation, chemicals regulation, we don't want to be diverging too much anyway in the medium term because we still need to trade. I see. Ross. Thanks. Convener, um, I understand why some people uh, believe that the only options left now are the deal put forward by the UK government or a no deal situation and in, in that scenario the deal would be preferable to no deal. Uh, I disagree with that, I think there are other options, but to look at the deal in and of itself for a moment, does anyone here believe that the deal uh, negotiated by the UK government will leave their sector in a better place than it is at the moment under current arrangements or in a situation that's just as good? No. The deal will leave us in exactly the same situation because we'll enter the transition period. What happens after that is another question. And that's as far as I can possibly yeah. answer you. Does anyone else want to come in on that? Silence says it all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was, uh, okay. Sorry, I, I just yeah. agree with what Chris has just said. Um, in terms of the political declaration, what it does seem to guarantee is a commitment to free and frictionless trade with the EU, um, particularly for agri-food goods. That's really, really important for us. Um, but yeah, to, to in transition period though. In the transition, but the pol political declaration seems to set out some sort of joint ambition to achieve this in the longer term. Uh, through the FTA. Hmm. Um, I couldn't possibly comment on what the status of those negotiations will, will end up as, but as long as the commitment's there, that's really important for certainty within our uh, sector. Annabelle Ewing? Yeah, well, just really on a point. I mean, if you're not in the single market, there cannot be frictionless trade. I mean, that's, you know, otherwise, what's the point of the single market? You know, that's the benefit of being in the club, okay? So, you know, that begs the question, you know, for all of you, really, uh, you know, if this deal got through the House of Commons, which all commentators suggest is not going to happen, um, but let's assume for a second it did. I mean, that's not the end of Brexit. You know, that's the start of a very, very, very long road of wrangling for years and years and years. But it is quite clear that if an option to remain in the single market is not an option that is being pursued by the UK government, we will not be in the single market. And therefore, you cannot have frictionless trade. And I just wonder given that obvious axiomatic fact, what planning are you all doing on the basis that you will not be in the single market at some stage? Um, Matt? I think Annabelle got in before me. Uh, it, 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 we won't have potentially, potentially won't have frictionless trade with the deal that's on the table at the moment. It isn't a, an EU single market uh, trade uh, agreement that sorry withdrawal agreement that has been expressed and that's been SCDI's position at the start of this process in terms of that's what we call for and that's what we favoured um, and it's not just movement of goods and services it's people and going back to that skills part again and, and how that actually works I believe the UK government are trying to mitigate uh, immigration and skills concerns with an immigration white paper, which I think is due in the new year, which will be interesting to see how how that can support that, that frictionless movement of people post-Brexit uh, too. Um, I think the other part of this is, is as part of that single market kind of uh, EU thing, is that the the access to negotiated trade deals that we already actually have and, and what happens in that particular perspective under this current deal too do we lose that access uh, under this particular deal and, and i'm not sure if that's the case or not going back to transition period it's both both barnier and uh, uh someone from uk government the energy minister um have both indicated or mooted that there is opportunity to extend that transition period to 2022 
um, which is something that SCDI again have championed in terms of a longer transition to allow businesses to adjust to ensure that there is free movement of people, well, to ensure that there is frictionless, sorry, not free, frictionless movement of people, goods and services as well. So it's a longer transition period, but the deal on the table is certainly not a, a it doesn't look like a frictionless trade deal. Okay, thanks very much. Did you want to say um, that, that clear? trying to be brief supplementary. Um, Matt mentioned the innovation white paper and one of the issues with single market membership is around freedom of movement having been one of the four pillars and the UK government's decision not to that seems to be one of the blocking areas. We had uh, Professor Manning, who's the chair of the advisory committee in front of the committee a few weeks ago, who made an argument that immigration had created a low-wage, low-skills economy in the UK and immigration was the driver of that. Um, and I wondered if members had views on, on that position. Um, I, I can quickly answer. The, the access to highly skilled labour only supports our economy moving forward. And, and many of our highly skilled uh, workers in, in Scotland come from different countries, whether that's in the EU or not. And, and that's a, a positive that we need to continue and move on. It's not just them doing a particular role and doing their job. It's, it's the fact that they open up uh, thinking around other cultures, thinking around innovation, thinking around how the economy moves forward. So in the main, having access to skilled labour, wherever it comes from, only supports our productivity moving forward in the economy in the future. I'm, I'm pleased the UK government are, are moving on on the immigration paper. Uh, as, but as we all know, the devil is in the detail as to, to what will be in that, and it's certainly something I think all of us will be... Uh, looking to uh, feed evidence and consulting in on, I suppose. Well, I don't mean if, if any of you want to comment, because he highlighted the agricultural sector and tourism sectors as sectors that should no longer expect to have cheap labour and labelled them as being areas that were flooded with cheap labour. Um, you know, and members around the table recognise we all represent areas that are... A lot of us represent areas that are agricultural. I have lots of fruit farms and Fife. There is a real pressure on employment there. I mean, how... Does it, and if you respond, or what are the proposals? How do, how do you see that being resolved in the future going forward? Well, it goes without saying we were really disappointed by, by the comments and quite shocked by some of the reports that came out afterwards. We, we fed in very strong evidence to the MEC at the time um, and, uh, and continue to uh, engage with them. But what we feel is that it's a slight misre misrepresentation of our sector and, and how it is constructed. Um, there's two strands to this. There's the seasonal labour aspect and the permanent labour aspect. Um, on seasonal workers, the MAC has recognised that we do need a bespoke solution um, for seasonal agricultural workers because uh, across the UK we employ about 60,000 every year on a temporary basis and about 99 to 100% of them come from outside of the UK. So we do need a solution there for them. Um, <clears throat> but to, to, to characterise the sector as low wage and low productivity um, is something that we dispute very strongly. Uh, I mean, even just taking the soft fruit sector as an example, um, we have a Scottish Agricultural Wages Board that means that all workers start at, um, at a base salary of £7.83 an hour, but many more will be, they'll be earning possibly two times or more that than, than that um, when, when you add in overtime um, and and you know, over you know higher pay for the more skilled workers and, and any um, of you have said that the seasonal workers permit while it's welcome there's not the figures aren't high enough there's not enough yeah absolutely uh, there is a trial scheme that has been announced um, for 2,500 workers to, uh, from outside the EU to come in during transition so that will be in addition to hopefully uh, the free movement of people that will be retained during transition so long as we don't crash out. But we know we had a shortage um, in the UK this year of about 10,000 workers. So even if the scheme brings in an additional 2,500, we already know that's a quarter of what we might need next year. So that, as a result, is meaning that businesses in Scotland are now holding back on investment. They're planting less crop um, because a lot of them lost crop this year and, and lost significant amount of money as a result. So, um, so that holds back the real potential of the sector. But one point I would labour is that even in soft fruit alone in Scotland, it's 0.6% of the utilisable agricultural land area, but responsible for more than 10% of agricultural output as a whole, and that's in a very livestock-dominated um, sector. So to, to talk down the productivity of soft fruit and, and field veg um, 
is is highly disappointing and something which we which we dispute okay. very strongly. Alistair, you wanted to come in. I just wanted to say, on, on, I think the, what what the UK government decides on immigration is absolutely vital. Um, I mean, I've, I've said earlier that you know the, the mobility of talent, the, the openness of universities to students and staff talent, really is, is is our lifeblood. I think um, you know we 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 are very very keen to see. Um, as open a uh, migration regime as possible for staff. Um, also for students coming from the EU, if you look at um, what students are doing who've come from the EU six months after they graduate, at least 40% of them are actually, um, who, who are working, are working in the Scottish workforce, bringing their high skills to Scotland and, and addressing um, the, the, the gaps that we know that we have in um, having enough people at high skill levels in our economy. Um, and I think on the student side, uh, well, on, on the staff side, I would say one of the things that disappointed me about the Migration Advisory Committee was that while it made some acknowledgement of the importance of talent coming to the UK, it then said, and we, we will distinguish talent by being somebody who earns £30,000 or more. Um, and, you know, frankly, if you're looking at a creative professional from uh, coming to or from a university, um, if you're looking at earliest stage um, researchers, they're not going to be earning £30,000, but they're going to be bringing an enormous amount of talent to our country. Um, and the other thing that disappointed me hugely was that um, given the, the very strong support there is across parties for a post-study work visa so that international talent can really contribute to, um, to Scotland's economy uh, after graduation, um, we were extremely disappointed that um, the MAC didn't recommend that um, and we really strongly valued across party consensus that still exists for that. Did you, you fed into the MAC, did you? Uh, we, we fed a great deal of evidence into yeah. the MAC, so okay. um, we felt the evidence really strongly supported that cross-party consensus. Right, thanks very much. Um, Jennifer, did you want to come in? Yeah, just to say that that's a really important issue for us as well. 35% um, of Scottish Bali, for example, are non-UK EU nationals. Um, overall, though, the same as GMC, we're 6% in creative industries. Um, in terms of who we rely on. Um, and we have 17 occupations on the occupation list. Um, so, yeah, again, yeah, just to, to reiterate that that's really important for us as well. Mm -hmm. And there's still a huge lack of detail on it. Are there any other comments from our witnesses about the MAC specifically before I move on, uh, Chris? Yeah, um, thanks, Chair. We, we had significant... We fed into the MAC report as well. Um, we had significant... Um, questions about the uh, conclusions that it drew. Um, just some quick figures. Um, we've estimated that in terms of drivers, we're looking at 13% uh, are uh, non-UK EU. But when you go back in the sort of the stream in the warehousing and other sort of logistics works, you're looking at up to 25% are non-UK EU. So we have got a significant portion. But we do have an, an uh, we had, we have significant issues with the fact that um, the tier two visa scheme will have this £30,000 limit because um, we estimate that 90% um, of logistics workers will fall below um, the, 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 the qualification framework to level two um, and 88% of them earn below 30000 but as somebody else just said they're not unskilled they just don't earn as much as other people um, they have, where we have a, another problem is unlike the agricultural sector there is no seasonal um, aspect there is no seasonal sort of dispensation for the logistics sector even though we face seasons we have you know the christmas is around the corner yeah. where there are serious peaks in in terms of the requirements for drivers um and also there are um no there is no and the, the fact that they're taking away the preference for eu workers is also problematic because at the moment you know qualifications are the same you know other than compared to rest of world workers in terms of driving licenses and professional qualifications, um, we would hope that that would be uh, looked at again um, as well. OK, thanks very much. Uh, Tavish Scott. Thank you. Uh, uh, after uh, March, presumably we'll be in the transition period, um, how do you plan to make sure that your voice is heard in Brussels? We'll have no Scottish MEPs. There'll be uh, no Scottish ministers or indeed UK ministers going to council meetings. Um, we'll be outside, but it'll all still be affecting you. Have your organisations thought about how you're going to influence the European system um, without the normal channels that we've all relied on for decades? Uh, Paul. 
So, um, we're part of a network of medical regulators across Europe called the European Network of Medical Competent Authorities. We're going to continue to be working very closely with them, regardless of what happens in March, so that while our voice can't be heard directly, it could be heard and amplified indirectly via our colleagues in Europe. And do you think they'll be comfortable to take your representations and make sure they're, they're heard in the quarters of power? I, I certainly think they would um, be interested in hearing our perspective and then finding a way of sharing that with colleagues in Brussels. Good. Good. Uh, we have um, a UK farming union's representation out in Brussels called the, the British Agricultural Bureau, or BAB for short. Um, I spent some time with them earlier this year actually doing a, a study trip to look at how third countries, not members of the EU, engage. And uh, my strong conclusion from that report was that they engage very well in the network and it's very much about who you know and maintaining those relationships. So we'll be maintaining our presence um, post-exit uh, with the BAB office. It's, it's going to stay there. Um, and it's, I, I suppose, um, it, when they don't have access to... Uh, you know, or outside of the council or commission, um, it's just very much about you know maintaining those relationships. It comes down to to people at the end of the day. Um, so, do you think, Claire, the NFU and the English NFU and the others will have to up their game in terms of presence in Brussels and possibly, so on and forth? possibly. Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose it'll probably be a, a bit of a suck it and see exercise about seeing some doors may close but others might open, and it'll be about finding allegiances possibly with with other countries who might not have usually been the typical bedfellows when, when we're in. Okay, Matt. Um, I think it'll be a challenging, <laughs> is, 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 is the honest answer uh, for anyone in, in this room, no matter what agencies or networks that we are connected to, and we'll always try our best to represent our members in Scotland's interests as everyone else around this table would. But without direct connected representation into Europe, that becomes more challenging, and, and that's just logic, and it, it's as simple as that. I think where SCDI has been across all sectors that we represent is that we believe in an open, inclusive, globally connected economy, and what we're seeing through the Brexit process is potentially some of that <coughs> being eroded, which doesn't help drive the support for our economy, to drive investment, to drive the productivity gap closer to up, upwards rather than downwards to drive talented people and people who just want to locate in the UK and Scotland because it's just a great place to live, whether that's to work in the rural economy, which is desperate for skills, which is desperate for, for support in their, their industries too. So in answer, we will be less connected and I think that's a fair and honest assessment. Our members, particularly the larger ones, have global businesses. I suspect they'll be connected in through their own business networks there. But in terms of Scottish businesses, particularly as SMEs, mm -hmm. they, they will struggle to find that representation. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Chris. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a kind of personal point to this uh, that question because until last year, I lived and worked in Brussels for almost 18 years, so I have first-hand experience of what it's You're like. Like restaurants, I, uh, <laughs> I can give you a few addresses, yes. Um, uh, and... Uh, um, the FTA is quite fortunate in its ability that we do actually have a Brussels office. It's actually situated within the CBI's office that um, over there and we have two people uh, running our um, liaison with the, the European institutions. But we are also members of wider trade bodies that are on a European uh, level. So we do have access to... Um, we have access to people who, have, who will continue to have access. So we can look at it that way. It is a reduced level of access. Um, however, I, I do know from personal experience that um, the uh, officials who do work in, for example, DG Move and, and in the Parliament, they do look to the UK as a good example of good best practice, certainly in sort of road transport, in terms of the quality of our legislation, in terms of the quality of our enforcement, and also the fact that we have some of the safest roads around. So um, they will continue to come looking at it, knocking at our door, but we will not have that open door to them in the future. But I think it's worth saying that um, what <laughs> I think our Brussels office is hoping this is going to be the case, that uh, one of the largest uh, delegations in Brussels is the Swiss delegation and they are not members of the EU so that there does need to be access uh, they, 
it, it, it will be valuable for associations and companies to maintain um, direct access in Brussels because you will need to have, especially certainly in the next couple of years, if we, if we enter the transition period, the discussions start. That's the beginning of the process. Um, so you do need to be there. You do need to be talking to people. So we will maintain our access in there. Okay. I think there's another couple of members want to come back in. Kenneth? Yes, thanks very much. Convener, just um, in terms of clear submission, you've said the NFUS has set out its grave concerns to the UK government and the excellent standards of production and heard to in Scotland must be met by any agricultural and food imports. And you said this is a red line for farmers and crofters in Scotland. Have you had any assurances that uh, this will be adhered to? There have been um, various verbal assurances that, um, that DEFRA Secretary of State and uh, the Secretary of State for Department of International Trade recognises the very high standards which we um, adhere to here and, and trade on and the fact it's our USP and you know, provenance in, in, uh, in outside markets. Um, that is welcome, but there's, there's nothing you know, set in legislation or set in stone that would actually maintain that as a principle. Um, so there's, there's an agriculture bill that's currently going through the, the UK Parliament, um, the elements of that which are, are UK-wide, and uh, an amendment that we are pushing quite strongly uh, with support of some SNP MPs um, is to put a principle in the bill that would basically ensure that no free trade uh, agreement could be struck with a third country that would uh, not have um, a principle of equivalence in terms of regulation and standards in there. Now. You can have a debate about whether or not it's appropriate to have an amendment of that sort in an agriculture bill when really it's it's an issue to do with trade, um, but, but it's essentially a probing exercise to see what sort of response we get out of the government um, by doing that. But there's also a trade bill going through and we would like to see that put in there. Um, but th there's, there's a big exercise that I think we as an industry need to do with governments about looking at how you actually match up um, equivalence, you, you know, with ter in terms of what we do here, in terms of our high standards of production, and how you might match that up with a third country such as Canada or the US um, from outside the EU. Um, I think that if we can present to governments um, where the real uh, issues or, or friction might be, then they could be more inclined to to put something in place to ensure these standards are upheld. But to answer your question, in short, there's nothing set in stone that will guarantee that as as a principle. Because there's real concerns, obviously, that standards may be allowed to slip in exchange for, for trade deals, you know, mm -hmm. so for example, with the United States, the old chlorinated chicken example has been used uh, uh, many times, so <coughs> just wondering if you think there could be a possibility that your industry could be traded off, uh, if you like, in exchange mm -hmm. for deals elsewhere, is that a concern that it, you, yeah, you do it, actually it, have? It, it's a huge concern, it's a huge concern, and... Um, and a concern which we raised, you know, even even prior to the referendum, you know, in the TTIP negotiations, mm -hmm. um, as well. Yes, um, it, it's it's certainly a possibility, and um, notwithstanding what happens with um, a transition agreement and whether or not we crash out of the the EU, um, I think there is a concern that UK government will be looking to do trade deals with third countries, um, you know, based on expedience, and things might get forgotten about or traded off. Um, so that that's an important role that we need to play in terms of really fighting for the interests of our industry and displaying what it is that we deliver and how catastrophic it could be if we do allow cheaper imports that are produced to a lower standard to come in and flood our market. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Stuart. In terms of trade, um, Chris touched upon this uh, in one of his earlier answers regarding the, uh, the settled status. Uh, if you don't actually have the staff to, uh, to produce... Uh, the products and uh, produce the uh, the items that to actually go to market. Then, uh, then the issue of trade it becomes a secondary issue, and then you get the, the other aspect of the the car park that's going to become the outside of Dover. Uh, so surely the, the issue of uh, settled status, the issue of uh, of the workforce, uh, could have been and actually should have been uh, one of the easiest issues to actually uh, be be dealt with at the very outset of this process. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't disagree. Uh, it's produced something you need people and, and, and such. So, uh, and um, I think that's the uncertainty that, that, that businesses feel across all sectors, whether that's in the rural economy or, or more urban economy as a whole, but particularly in the rural economy where businesses struggle to attract and, and retain people um, within that economy too for various amounts of reasons. Um, 
Yeah, in terms of um, where we go with our immigration policy next, it's it's that's the ball is in UK government's court, and 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 they've suggested that there's a white paper due in 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 the new year. Until we see that white paper, until there's uh, uh, an organisation that represents Scottish businesses, we we can't either challenge or agree or, or support or reinforce or whatever it is within that paper we feel that we have to work with. I think it, I think a good suggestion might be that um, more information is brought quicker about that white paper and what's in it and certainly more effort to perhaps share some of that information with colleagues around the table from UK government would help ease some of the concerns of our members across sectors. Um, but the speed of that, obviously, with Brexit being the focus of the civil service at this moment in time, and rightly so, because it's it's a massive change to 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 everything in in the UK and Scotland. Uh, it's going to take some time to 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 get that immigration paper together and, and understand what's within it. But it is critical now that that is moved forward quickly. More conversation needs to be focused on it going forward, where it's no deal or a deal that we've got on this table at this moment in time, come March the 30th, we need to know where we're heading in terms of our skill supply from, from overseas. But also, another part of this, we've got to look at some of the opportunities within that if we look towards the digital economy and we look towards new trade deals as well. How do we support that activity in terms of uh, skilled, skilled, educated people as well as non-skilled labour that supports a variety of jobs in care and in tourism? as we move forward to. Chris, you wanted to come in there? Uh, yeah, I fully support that, that we do need uh, more guidance and also firm words on paper from UK government. And, and going back to one of the challenges our members are facing in terms of this aspect, we, we know that there's going to be the settled status scheme. They are starting to trial it, it's starting to come in. But our members are very wary about it because Going, literally going down to this kind of level of employment law. It's the same as asking, are you going to start a family? Are you going to get settled, settled status? It presupposes, and a lot of our members are really worried about the uh, legal implications of those kind of questions that they are now being kind of forced to ask their members of staff because if that person says no and then they lose their job, could they then take that company to you know, to tribunal saying, well, you got rid of me because I didn't give you that guarantee that I was getting settled status. It's a very t legal problem at the moment, but our members are telling us that this is one of the aspects that they are really worried about in terms of this whole process. OK, thanks. Annabelle? Uh, yes. It's not directly on, on uh, what Chris has just said, but just, you know, the issue of trade, and obviously at the moment we have the benefit of some 40 trade deals, you know, being part of the, the customs union. And, you know, in that context, therefore, and it's really, I suppose, initially a question for Claire, um, you know, the position, important position of geographical mm. indications, you know, where do you feel that that issue currently stands and where do you feel that issue is going? Because that is crucially important, <coughs> obviously, to the, the Scottish food sector, food and drink sector. Um, so I just wondered if you had any intelligence on where do you think that is going? Because obviously we lose the benefit of the 40 trade deals that we are currently party mm -hmm. to, where geographical indications are protected. Yeah, um, so current advice from UK government, uh, we, we wrote to UK government about this um, a couple of months ago to highlight the exact concerns that you've raised there. They have given us a level of reassurance that um, all GIs um, that are held at, at the current time um, will will basically be carried over with with no changes needing to be made. So that'll be upheld. Um, in terms of how the trade deals are, are, are carried over, I'm not I'm not quite sure. But the principle of maintaining those geographical indications will remain. Um, post exit, um, a new scheme of UK GI will then be developed. It had been our preference for the UK government to simply adopt the EU's GI scheme because we felt that that would be less of a administrative and bureaucratic burden on anyone making the application but the the reassurance I suppose that we've received from UK government is that um, it'll be essentially like for like um, and that th there'll be very very similar schemes in the UK and in the EU so the UK government uh, is uh, is convinced that there won't be any additional cost in terms of time or, or money for anyone making the application at the current time so that does provide a level of reassurance but more widely 
Um, we were very concerned that in the, the recent negotiation of the CETA trade deal, um, the UK government essentially forgot to submit a list of UK GIs um, into that trade deal. Uh, we made a lot of noise about it at the time and it was it was corrected retrospectively, but um, I think that just showed a, a level of uh, misunderstanding, I suppose, of, of what the, you know, the, the primary concerns would be for food producers and food exporters. Um, I hope that that sort of mistake wouldn't happen again. Um, but again, that's that's for that's for the the farming and food lobby to make sure that these things are prioritised in the negotiation of any new free trade arrangements. Well, indeed, but obviously timing is an issue. I would have thought as well. I mean, even if the, the deal goes through, there is an extension of the transition period to twenty twenty two. I mean, at some stage, you know, we we do lose the benefit of these forty trade deals that are already in existence, where the GI is protected. So, I mean, what do your members envisage? happening uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, come a certain date, there will be, you know, a gap. What, what do your members envisage happening? Because it won't be possible to conclude 40 trade deals in the next four years, presumably. So, Presumably. Uh, I mean, we, we don't have we don't have the sort of expertise in-house um, to, to, to be able to, to say with any certainty about what might happen in terms of those being carried over or, or renegotiated. Um, all that we know is that what we have on the table here in terms of the draft withdrawal um, agreement is a transition period, it's a starting point, a pathway to hopefully end up with you know free and, fr free and frictionless principle um, with the EU um, and carrying over those trade deals. So uh, we just have to use that as a starting point and, and make sure that we, we make a lot of noise about the interests of our members. Okay, okay. Vaughan Ross Greer. Thanks, Camille. This actually expands on Annabelle's points. Mentions has been made a couple of times now about the transition period giving your sectors uh, an opportunity to prepare. It gives businesses an opportunity to prepare. But the question then is prepare for what? Given the way the negotiations have gone over the last couple of years and, and <coughs> CETA and, and TTIP just being mentioned, both of those sets of negotiations took eight, nine years and then TTIP didn't actually come to anything. How are your sectors able to prepare over the next two and a half years uh, when we're not at a point to know what comes after that? Um, I could come in on that if you want. Um, again, it's just about the bigger companies and the ability to prepare. So um, there are technical notices and there is the Scottish Enterprise Guidance and Creative Industries Federation Guidance for pre uh, preparedness. But again, it's um, if you're a big company, you can have the staff to work on what you're going to do. And again, the small companies and the freelancers don't have anyone, so they are unable to prepare, mostly. Um, they're going to have to just kind of see what happens. Um, but again, yeah, the bigger, the bigger companies can do things like, well, we know that we've got seven staff that we can't replace if they go, because we're unlikely to be able to get seven staff that can all speak three languages each. You know, things like that. So there, there's some so, some things you can do to prepare, but um, the majority of the industry being SMEs, there's nothing they can really do. So as far as the doctors is concerned, the political declaration talks about the need for there to be appropriate arrangements for the recognition of qualifications following the implementation period, which is effectively a blank sheet of paper. So what we would want to do during the, the two years, if th this is what happens, is make best use of that time to develop a, a future framework for registering doctors. Um, we're on record as making clear that we don't regard the current directive is a perfect instrument. We think in some respects it's too permissive. In other respects, it's too restrictive. We think there are alternative approaches uh, that would work better for everyone. Uh, and we would want to use that period to engage uh, closely with uh, UK government, with Scottish government and others, and then in Europe to try and get an agreement that the future framework for recognition of qualifications needs to retain what's good now, and there's lots of things that are good, but there are some areas where it needs to move on, and we would want that to be part of uh, any future arrangement. Thank you, Alistair. Um, I think in this transition period, and you know, I hope we have one, um, because the, the prospects of crashing out are just, just so appalling. Um, but I think in this transition period, we'd be looking to 
to negotiate um, stable arrangements for um, the future relationship with, with the EU in our areas. So, for instance, making sure that um, we buy into um, the, the, the Horizon Europe programme to sustain our research cooperation so that we continue to be um, in Erasmus Plus and also, I think, vitally picking up on GMC's point um, so that rec there is mutual recognition of qualifications because it's incredibly important to our students if you're training to be a doctor or an architect or, 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 or a vet or whatever, um, that your professional qualification um, is something that, that, that's portable um, across borders. Um, so uh, I think we'd also be looking during this um, transition period to be um, working with Scottish Government on what are the arrangements um, that we can put in place uh, policy-wise domestically to ensure that we can continue to attract EU students on a sustainable basis um, so that we continue that, that, that openness to talent and, and people coming into um, that, that supply pipeline of, of skills that, that we really need in the Scottish economy. Okay. Can, can, I, can I just... ...aspect of this because, um, you know, there have been, you know... Uh, Doubts raised as to whether a trade deal can be achieved, which um, which solves the problem of the uh, Northern Ireland border and the commitments to that. So we then uh, we have this backstop arrangement put in place, where there's a, a UK wide customs backstop, but there's a deeper uh, backstop for Northern Ireland, which means that Northern Ireland's a full member of the single market when the rest of the UK, including Scotland, is not. And I wondered whether any of you in your sectors had looked at the impact of that in your sectors, for example, whether that would give uh, Northern Ireland an economic advantage uh, over Scotland in particular? Kenneth? Well, can I just say that last night, on well, news the fishing sector said it would? They said that Northern, so that's one sector it's not represented here, but they've said that it would certainly give Northern Ireland advantage over the Scottish fishing yeah. industry. I know I represent the south of Scotland, as you know, and uh, I, I often hear farmers talking about existing competition in terms of dairy and dairy products from uh, from Northern Ireland. Um, so I, I'm thinking in terms of of, of um, farming and, and food production, I would have thought that Northern Ireland would indeed have an economic advantage. Yeah, certainly. I was just uh, looking back through my notes to see um, what my colleagues in Northern Ireland have said about this, actually. But yeah, I suppose you're quite right. Worst comes to worst, and that backstop option does kick in. It will certainly have implications for trade flows and, and movement of, of animals and goods um, you know, within the UK. And that, that would be a, a bit of a concern for our producers here. Um, I mean, in terms of what is currently <clears throat> on the table, um, my colleagues in Northern Ireland, the Ulster Farmers Union, have, have welcomed it. Um, they, they, they believe that it delivers what they've been asking for in terms of continued access to the, the GB and the Republic of Ireland market. So I suppose that the hope is that just get shoulder to the wheel and, and do find um, some sort of solution to, to the trade issue um, after transition. But it's, yeah, it's all to play for. Okay. Matt? I think it goes back to the start of this where, where the would Draw deal itself isn't a customs union as such. It it it, it, it isn't that, and and the Northern Ireland problem has been a critical aspect of that moving forward. Does it make it economic advantageous? I, I wouldn't like to say I don't know the Northern Irish economy as well as I know the Scottish economy, um, but I think it goes back to what certainly SCDI have been asking for within the withdrawal agreement was a customs union and that's not within for the whole of the UK and that is not within the deal itself. Okay. Thanks very much. Jamie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just following on this this line of questioning, um, I think it's uh, it's pleasing that the NFU and the Northern Ireland uh, are uh, supportive of the withdrawal agreement, but for the purpose of this session in this panel Going back to the theme of, of this line of questioning is what is the panel's view on the withdrawal agreement? Business, of course, was asking for transition. Industry was asking for transition. The idea we could just simply leave the EU and go straight into the new world was a, a daunting prospect for many industries. And there was, a, a, I think, a collective amount of recognition there would need to be some form of transitional period. Does this withdrawal agreement offer that transition that was asked for? And secondly, uh, and, and we could pontificate 
on, on the political wishes of what should happen next. But if the reality is that it's this withdrawal agreement or we leave at the end of March and become overnight a third country, and you can call that what you like, a hard Brexit, a cliff edge, a, you know, that's, that's, that's for, for, for headlines purpose, but for the, for the, from a pr practical point of view, for your industries and your businesses, uh, what would be the preference to move into transition or to become a third country at the end of March? Hey, Matt. Yeah, uh, I think no, no deal, the impact would be disastrous for, for, for the Scottish economy. And whilst there are obviously things in the deals that, that the deal right now that people will support, uh, as well as people be a bit more cautious around, I think where we, we sit right now is that uh, there's a scenario which is no deal, we, we, having no deal is just disastrous in the Scottish economy. The deal itself that we, we've got on the table is something that I think we need to probably gather support around and, 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 and try and move forward because, as I say, going into no, no deal territory is, is probably not responsible for, for the state, the Scottish economy and that moving forward and businesses within that moving forward too. So we are, we are in that situation, no, no deal I wouldn't like to say where we would be in a year, couple of years' time having this conversation again. Chris? Uh, yeah, uh, it's quite simple from our perspective. Um, we support the withdrawal agreement because contained within the withdrawal agreement is the uh, transition period. We don't know what we're transitioning to at the moment, but it gives us that period of time in which to do, which doesn't exist at the moment. But also the uh, one of the other key elements of the withdrawal agreement is that it deals with the issue of citizens' rights, both EU27 in the UK and UK in EU27, which then will give a legal firm uh, status of uh, EU27 citizens in this country, um, which enables then the government to pass uh, legislation for its immigration appeals, but it gives uh, legal certainty um, for, for people, but also for companies for a period of time in which we can then find what the new world order will be. And we continue to hold out. We'll hold the UK government to account on that because they've promised us frictionless travel, uh, frictionless trade in the future, and that is what we will demand that they deliver us. Oh. So we don't have a, a view as such on the merits of the withdrawal agreements, largely a political question, but we do have a view on the impact and certainly we do absolutely see the value of there being a two-year implementation period. The alternative whereby from the end of March we treated doctors from the EEA as if they were from, say, Southeast Asia or other parts of the world and had to go through various laborious assessment and testing processes that could take six to 12 months or so to get them onto the medical register. A sudden lurch into that position, we think, would pose really quite significant uh, risks for the medical workforce. Can I just put it out there that, obviously, as, as has already been said, I mean, it's the political situation is that this particular withdrawal agreement doesn't look as if it's going to get through the House of Commons. So therefore, um, there are there have been alternatives that have been put out there. For example, um, membership of the EEA, the Single Market and Customs Union. Um, what would uh, witnesses uh, be, if we moved to that? If this deal collapses, would that be a, a solution that uh, witnesses would find attractive? Yes. Just, just very, very quickly. I mean, for, from the outset, we said it's you know a matter of record. Our position was if we have to leave the EU at all, we'd want to maintain a single market and customs union membership. But I mean, just to go back to the previous question, um, we realise that that isn't an option that is politically palatable for the UK government at the moment. And, and you know what we're commenting on at the moment is what is on the table, and that is the withdrawal agreement. So we've said um, just to go back to Jamie's question, if it was between this or a no deal. <coughs> we'd have to take the transition and, and the withdrawal agreement. But in terms of other options, we'd have to consider them on their merits, um, but it's, it's not currently on the table. And what we're very concerned about is that it's so politically fraught, um, we're damned to comment on on uh, you know any anything, uh, any other outcome than what we currently have on the table. So um, if that does if that does come, come about and there is an alternative arrangement put on the table, I'll have to consider it. But the other point I would go back, just go back to my previous comments right at the start, is that 
an elongated period of uncertainty and not knowing where we're headed to um, has been so damaging to confidence within our industry. And if there were to say be an extension to Article 50 um, and, and further political toing and froing as to where we end up, I think that, that that wouldn't be palatable for our members either, that we need to move on from this and, and get a deal in place. Okay, Alistair. Um, I think the very worst possibility is, is, is no deal. I mean, our policy objectives of maintaining student um, mobility, uh, maintaining um, openness of, to, to mobility of talent from EU, maintaining our, our really close research partnerships that do, do work that, you know, really researchers how to make the world a better place and improve society. I mean, these, these can't be achieved under a no-deal scenario. So, um, you know, by, by whatever route needs to be taken um, between now and um, the 29th of March, we need to be getting into a scenario where we, 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 we at least have a transition period and a period to negotiate our future relationship with the European Union and its programmes. I, I, you know, the politicians are better placed than us to, to chart their way through that. So have we got any other, um, any other witnesses that want to come in before I go back to members? Yes. Just to say, the freight industry's role is to deliver in the in the condi the best way in the conditions available. So we will continue to work, and we will put in place the supply chains necessary for the legal framework that is presented to us. But so we don't sort of want to get involved in the political discussions, but because that is not our job, that is the job of the political class, and we have been promised that we will have frictionless trade in the future. So it is your job as politicians to give us that and deliver us that. I don't think frictionless is a word that's used. It's not in the document, no. no. But it was the aspiration and it was promised, but it didn't actually appear in the document. Doesn't that, does that concern you? There are many words that don't concern, that appear in the document, but they might um, uh, you know, appear in future uh, legal texts. Or, but you don't need to have the word frictionless. You it's specifically in there to have frictionless trade. You, you know, you that I don't think will survive a sort of a jurist linguist uh, review of a legal text having frictionless because there'll be many questions about what does that mean. Right. You put other words in you know, yeah. to get to the My same. My understanding goal. is the legal text is not going to change. But Annabelle, yeah, I mean on that point, I, I think, and I, I made the point before. You know, as a matter of EU law, um, you know. We have frictionless trade at the moment because we're in the single market and customs union. We, if we're not in the single market, we can't have what we have at the moment. That's clear. I mean, this, this, that's just it. Um, so in that regard, the word frictionless is not appropriate because frictionless is what we have now. And that will be taken away if, unless we're in the single market. So sadly, that is the position. Um, just picking up uh, on some of the comments made, I mean, and I think it's a point I already made. The idea that, you know, if this deal gets through the House of Commons, which, as has been noted, commentators feel is, is highly unlikely, um, the idea that then we're kind of, oh, it's all clear and it's all fine, it's not. This is the beginning of the toing and froing. You know what I mean? This is years and years and years of wrangling. This is not certainty. This is not the new dawn. This is more of the same for years, though. For years and years and years so i think it's important just to remind ourselves of the reality of that situation it's not the the, the stopping of the toing and froing far from it and i think that should you know be something that all your your members are very well aware of this is the you know not the end but you know just the beginning of a whole new period of uncertainty and what the key message would be is that um our members are very clear that they only want to switch one time so we, can, we can't have a transition period to one situation, but then possibly another switch in a few, you know, another change of legal frameworks in a couple more years. Whatever we move to, that has to be it. You know, that, can, that has to be a, me a key message from our members. They want one time only uh, you know, legal. So, but that could equally apply to, you know, if the deal doesn't go ahead. I, and I think it's a UK cabinet secretary who has said that there's no majority in the House of Commons as far as they're concerned for no deal. So, we're in kind of quite uncharted territory, I think. But I mean, if the 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 option were to be to remain in the single market, uh, presumably the, in terms of the one switch point you've just made, Chris, that that would be a switch that would be uh, welcome. 
<laughs> Stuart McMillan. Uh, I think Annabelle kind of touched upon the, the point there, but I think it's worthwhile just to remind everyone as well that, that Scotland doesn't appear in the document either. Um, it's not just uh, frictionless. Um, but going back, going back to something that Chris uh, said earlier regarding, um, uh, regarding promises, uh, now it's been quite clear that throughout this process that the, the Scottish uh, government uh, has it's not been listened to by the UK government. So uh, the, even uh, at the very beginning of the process, um, the Prime Minister and the UK government stated that, uh, that all the devolved nations, well, sorry, all the nations within the UK would actually be, uh, would, would be incorporated into some type of deal going forward. But that clearly hasn't been the case. So how are you sure that any promises that, to, that the, your association have been given will actually be followed through? The way to judge that is is take what they have said to us and what we are given at the end of it and make that balanced judgment at that moment. But as Annabelle said, um, also further discussions will take quite some time. It will take years and years and years. So uh, what damage will be done to your association and also to trade and also to the economy in that period of time? If we... If the we start from a position where we are, in terms of EU trade, one and the same. So, theoretically, it shouldn't be... The, the negotiation should be concluded in a way that, you know, does not bring in too many barriers to trade from that position. And that should, in, that should hopefully be concluded within the transition slash implementation, whatever you want to call it, phase. Whether that is extended is another question that is for other people to answer. Um, we are also aware of um, what we what we do need to be aware of is how any decisions taken on that uh, affect rest of world trade, which happens at the moment. So we do need to be aware that any kind of new legal framework vis-a-vis -vis the EU, as we come out of trade, as we come out of trade agreements signed by the EU, of which we are now part of, as we fall out of that, if they are not rolled over, for example, into, for allowed to the UK, there could be potentially damage if we do not get that correct as well. So the rest of world trade needs to be kept in the back of the mind as well, in terms of as you know, new trade policy with the EU is put forward. Um, but um, you know, we it's it's a tough question to answer. Let's just say that um, we are keenly aware of what our members need and they tell us quite vocally what they need and that is what we um, advance to government. Okay. Matt. Um, yeah, I, I think obviously the transition period will will still continue to uh, impact on, on businesses and organisations as, as Annabelle suggested. And, and I think we need, I think most businesses recognise that as, as well go, going forward too. But there's also an essence in businesses around opportunities too, and, and we, we mustn't forget that as part of the, the Brexit discussion in terms of opportunities, perhaps in UK industrial strategy, opportunities with the new Scottish National Investment Bank, opportunities that exist in our economy too. So whilst Brexit obviously is the front and centre of businesses and the economy's mind, we also need to remember that around the sides of Brexit, there are big opportunities for for Scottish businesses to take and grasp, and, and we need to support them to achieve those too. But also being mindful, Brexit's the, the key thing. Alexander, you wanted back in, is it? Because we do, I'm, I'm aware that we have very little, uh, no, very little time left. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we, we've talked about the dangers and you've talked about the threats that every one of your organisations and individuals and structures are, are dealing with. Do you see any opportunities for your organisations and your structures within this whole process? I could just... we, we touched on it earlier, but I think the, the opportunity to leave the CAP and design and implement a new agricultural policy fit for Scotland is, is a real a real price from this process. Of course, it will depend entirely on the trading framework, our ability to recruit non-UK workers, and of course, having a budget in place. But if, if, if we get all of those things, then um, we can do 
what we do in terms of food production here in, in Scotland so much better um, if our Cabinet Secretary here is able to design and implement um, measures that actually fit the profile of Scottish agriculture. So that is a real opportunity. Paul. So similarly, um, we would want to use whatever emerges to uh, design a new, more flexible framework for uh, medical regulation with much greater flexibility. That's something that we were saying long before anybody was even thinking about Brexit. That's something that we're still saying now. OK, are there any closing comments? Well, in that case, we'll just uh, wind up. And can I thank all our witnesses for coming to give evidence to us today? Thank you very much. And we'll move into private session now.